Yeah. All right, everyone. Welcome. Thank you much, very much for uh, attending the Valentine's Day special. <laughs> this is about roses, right? <laughs> no. Either way, it's my uh, my great pleasure to uh, uh, intro introduce Dr. Victoria Wagner, uh, one of the department's uh, recent hires. <laughs> Enough that, uh, that this is her introductory uh, lecture in the Chair's Lecture Series. Uh, I think the next one is uh, Kirst King-Jones on, I think Linda sent it to me and I completely forgot the date, uh, the 14th of March, so uh, absolutely a month from today. Uh, again, it's my pleasure. Oh, sorry, Victoria. I am sorry to announce. I do have to run, so I can't stay for the talk. Dr. Proctor is going to field what I'm sure will be a, a round of uh, aggressive questions. Uh, but uh, let me present oh, you with the department you. swag mm. in advance of the, uh, the I end need a of new bottle. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, like, yeah, you bugged me about uh, a Valentine story, and I have to say that I don't have one with me. Uh, because I'm not a very romantic person. And in fact, when, um, when Mike and Linda asked me uh, for a date for my talk, I chose February 14th, not realizing that this is Valentine's Day. <laughs> so maybe somebody else should, should have taken over that date because I'm going to talk about a topic that uh, stirs uh, sometimes very negative sentiment among people that border on, on, um, on hate and bitterness against invasive species and plants in particular. So here on the left side is a poster for uh, advocating for control of cheek grass, uh, Bromus tectorum. So this is a non-native grass from Eurasia that was introduced to North America. It's become very invasive, especially in the western part of North America. Um, the second is a poster, a Invasive Species Awareness Day at the University of uh, Scarborough, featuring UFOs flying over the landscape and some in introduced organisms, uh, including smooth brome, uh, again, a grass from Eurasia. And then the third one, arrest the pest, a green organism that I was unable to identify. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so a lot of negative um, sentiment here. On the other hand, we've also seen recently in the recent years, uh, books like this, Invasive Plant Medicine, the Ecological Benefits and Healing Abilities of Invasives. So total opposite. Where do camels belong? Why invasive species aren't all bad? And then you might have seen this opinion letter that came out in Nature in 2010, I believe, uh, led by Mark Davis and 18 other ecologists who argued don't judge species based on their origins. Why we should not, um, uh, should we think our, um, our uh, values of, um, around invasive species? So, and at the beginning of my talk, I wanted to take the opportunity, similar to Dave Coltman, <laughs> and define my position on this. Um, <laughs> give you credit. Um, uh, and since, since you've hired me, I can do that. <laughs> so and I can tell you that um, I see like, these two um, views as opposing views, two different uh, opposite poles along a gradient. And I think most ecologists would agree with me. They would see themselves somewhere falling in between here. So what you will not hear from me today is how awful invasive uh, species are. So I'm not in the club that argues, um, that uses strong language uh, for advocacy. But I'm also not in the camp of saying we should, um, you know, um, don't, uh, we shouldn't judge species based on their origin. I think we should just, uh, judge species based on their impact. And invasive species do have... Um, a negative impact. So, so once we've clarified these philosophical questions, um, I can talk about uh, my topic. So I do, my main research area is in invasion ecology, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction into biotic exchange. I will talk about my um, research. The first one is herbicide usage in non-native plants. This is how I got into invasion ecology. So I didn't study it as a student. I did my PhD thesis in a, in a totally different topic and I became interested in invasive plants, um, yeah, starting with my postdoc work. And then uh, my current research is in invasibility across habitat types. So it's sometimes um, claimed that invasion ecology is a new branch of ecology, which is not true. Um, 
as Kovarik and Pishek have uh, outlined in their paper in 2012, invasion ecology is in fact probably as old as ecology as a science. And that's because I think this wrong perception is because of language barriers. So a lot of the literature that was published in natural history and early ecology was from a variety of different languages, English, but also uh, French, German, and Russian. So um, one of the early natural historians who, um, who wrote about in, um, non-native plants and in invasions was Augustin de Candol, uh, a French natural historian. And he was perfectly aware of the concepts of introduced plants and plants escaping. Um, but he was also very broad. The, the first invasion ecologist in the narrow sense was Albert Thelon, uh, or Thelon, a Swiss ecologist. And he built his whole career on invasion ecology. So he um, specifically uh, studied certain sites where he believed uh, there would be hot spots of introduction. He wrote uh, a book called La Flore Adventiste de Montpellier. Um, where, and he, he knew, like he was able to differentiate the, some, between the different status of invasive plants or introduced plants, like casual plants, naturalized plants, and invasive plants. So a lot of the concept that we're using today, in fact, uh, many ecologists have thought about a long time ago. So, and then uh, furthermore, it's claimed by critics of invasion ecology that species introductions have happened in the past. Why should we care? And I agree with the first one. I don't agree with the second one. But the first is totally true. So the biotic exchange we're seeing today is not new on our planet. Um, there used to be, um, in the past, uh, introductions, deliberate introductions. They're well documented. For instance, from ancient Egypt, when Egypt was at its maximum extent of, its, of the empire, the uh, pharaohs that were in charge back then specifically asked their military when they did campaigns abroad to bring back uh, plants and animals. So for instance, Tutmosis III is known to have been a lover of rare plants and animals. And so when you, in the, in the temple where he was buried, you'll see a wall with depictions of plants. And this wall is also known as the Botanical Garden of Akmenu Temple. So probably lots of introductions that happened already there then. So, but these are deliberate introductions. It's much harder to, um, to uh, have um, information on historic accidental introductions. This is where um, Akio Botany uh, can um, <clears throat> inform us. And uh, we know from, uh, from macro remains, plant macro remains, that accidental introductions took place with the start of the agricultural revolution. And the, what I'm going to present here is, is only what we know from Europe. That's because where my training, my training was in Europe. Uh, I took an acubotany course as a student. So we know that um, at the beginning of the Neolithic agricultural revolution, plants spread from uh, the Middle East to <coughs> Europe, not only crop plants, food plants, but also um, non-food non plants, let's say it this way. So for instance, uh, common poppy, cornflower and chamomile, so a lot of plants that we associate with, you know, that we have incorporated into our culture were in fact, in fact old invaders. Um, I included this plant here, Ribrome, Bromosecalinus, uh, because it has a very interesting biology. It's only found in, in rye fields um, and it mimics the phenology of the crop plant that it's associated with. So it um, germinates and ripens at the same time as, as rye. So quite interesting. We also know um, from some papers that these archaeophytes are found in specific habitat types, which is very interesting to me because this is my research field. Um, we know that they're associated with, especially with um, uh, crop field, crop field margins, rural vegetation, also trampled areas. Now these are also the habitat types that are strongly endangered in Europe, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and that's why people care about them. So a lot of the archaeophytes or old invaders are now red listed. And I know that this has been used by critics and say, you know, um, on the one hand, we're trying to control the new invaders, but on the other hand, we're trying to protect the old invaders. 
And I don't think it's so much to, has to do with us changing our value system. It's because these habitat types have become so rare. So here on the left side, you can see a very species rich uh, margin of an arable field. High diversity, this is probably how a lot of Europe looked like about 100 years ago. And this is how it looks today. So when you go travel in Europe, you'll see that the field margins are often um, dominated by some very few competitive plants, usually grasses. And that has to do with a dramatic change in land use, specifically the use of pesticides in, in crops, the use of um, fertilizers. Europe has a very uh, big problem with eutrophication, but also um, improvements in agricultural methods like um, cleaning seeds because so many uh, of these archaeophytes are linked with their crop plants. Cleaning seeds has led to um, a decline in, in those archaeophytes. Some, even, some plants have even gone extinct regionally, like corn cockle here, Agostema gitago, as I found out, is now extinct in um, Britain and Ireland. So, so these are the, the old invaders, um, but then came the modern biotic exchange. So starting with the European colonial expansion, not, not some few you know, single regions were linked, but suddenly different continents became linked. And then in, in more recent times, this really took off because, um, because of human migration and because of our economic ties. So this is a map, uh, a flights map of, um, of uh, uh, a world map of flights, which shows how, how tightly connected we've become in the last decades. And this has opened up opportunities for biotic exchange, of course. And this has been quantified recently by Mark van Kleinen and colleagues. Um, they've put together a large database of naturalized non-native plants across the globe. And they, according to their estimate, about 13,000 plant species have been exchanged across the continents, which is an amazing number. And again, this, it's not that, yes, it's right, um, there used to be um, some regional exchange of plants in the past, but the modern biotic exchange is so much larger in its magnitude. Um, and you can see this here. This is a, a pie based on data from um, Pishek et al, uh, based on the floor of the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic is a very small country, but it somehow always has a surplus of botanists. <laughs> so it's very well studied. Um, <clears throat> so I took, pulled these numbers from the paper and it shows that the percentage of archaeophytes in the whole Czech flora is only 8% compared to the neophytes, which are the modern um, um, plants introduced in modern times, which make up 25%. And we know for sure that this number will not change, but this number is increasing. So the magnitude here is, is about three times more of neophytes compared to archaeophytes. Humans, for sure, play a role in this um, uh, through different means. Here, um, I've shown you a, a picture that's showing a botanical garden in the 19th century. Especially in the 19th century, a lot of the plants that were exchanged were because people were so fond of exotic plants. Um, it was somehow in vogue to have, um, uh, to trade with non-native plants, to plant them in your garden. Um, non-native plants were good for everything. So these were deliberate introductions. And we know that very early in the 19th century, introduced plants made up the, um, the majority of plants uh, introduced in a region. So here's a paper from, from the continental United States. They've quantified, um, they looked at where the, how the plants, non-native plants were introduced in the past. And all of these introduced pretty much until the middle of the last century were mostly deliberately introduced. So think of the, um, um, there's a program also in Alberta that uh, promotes shrub, planting of shrubs by the government. Well, anyway, the government had several programs uh, where they tried to convince uh, farmers and other landowners to use non-native plants for various reasons. Shelterable program, you go. So Alberta had a shelterable program, I think it's still intact, 
where they um, advertised to use non-native plants. So, so a lot of these plants were like introduced plants, but in recent times, it seems that the accidentally introduced plants make up half of the species pool that's introduced. And also, as you can see here on this side, um, this is a similar scale, but look at the numbers. So the accidentally introduced species to North America um, are 127 species compared to 670 species that, that were deliberately introduced. And a lot of them due to ornamental, for ornamental purposes. So now I'm going to bore you with uh, some theory. <laughs> and I promise there will be very little theory, but still um, a, a lot of concepts in invasion ecology, and I think it's important um, to keep them in mind. So this is uh, a conceptual figure that I like very much from Richardson and colleagues because it combines scale, which is so important in ecology, processes, stages, and uh, species status. So basically, our concept of um, plant introductions or species introductions is that plants have to undergo different, um, diff different um, filters, and based on how successful they are, they can be classified in different categories. So first of all, here are the geographic barriers. We as humans play a role because we help them to um, cross these barriers. Um, then, so the, all, all of the um, introduced non-native uh, non plants are called alien species or exotic species. Then casual non-native plants are those that are introduced, but they are not able to successfully reproduce. So for instance, um, I like gardening. I'm going to give an example from a gardening experience, at least in Europe. Uh, tomatoes or potatoes would often show up the year after you've planted them. So they, they're able to tolerate the, the climate, but they're not very successful in reproducing. So these are the casual plants. Then all other plants that are able to reproduce from year to year are called naturalized plants. They disperse, and it's only a small group, like within these naturalized plants, group that uh, is invasive. And the definition of invasive plants varies, and, but it's very important for policy because um, there's a mandate to control invasive plants. But it's usually thought um, that invasive plants are those that are able to colonize natural habitats and it usually um, also burden us with high economic costs. So invasive plants, why should we care about invasive plants? First of all, because there's a very strong evidence that at the local scale, invasive plants can outcompete other plants. So here's an example that I bring you from Alberta. This is a photo I sh uh, took when I did field work last summer from the uh, Kinsella region in central Alberta. This is a plot that's almost completely dominated by uh, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, Pua pratensis, which is a, a, a plant introduced from Europe or Eurasia. So in this plot, we, I mean, there are still some non-native plants underneath the dense litter layer, but those plants are usually not in a reproductive stage, so just vegetating. Uh, and there are other uh, examples of where, where non-native plants can dominate local stands of native vegetation. And poor pretensis is very interesting because um, it was not listed as a noxious plant, and still is not. I'm not sure it's listed in Alberta, but it's become very invasive in in the northern Great Plains. And some, there's been some recent papers that have highlighted this, that probably because it was seeded so much, together with smooth brome, it became very invasive. Uh, but because it was never listed as a noxious plant, um, it's very poorly studied. It was never controlled. So this is local uh, biodiversity. Um, as I mentioned, scale is very important in ecology. And there's some debate to <coughs> what extent non-native plants endanger regional biodiversity. So they, I think there's not a single case of a plant species that went extinct globally because of non-native plants. I don't think that has ever been reported, but to what extent it can lead regionally to plant extinctions, species, I'm not sure. So uh, in 2000, I think 15, this paper came out based on analysis of the British flora. And what they found is that um, the non-native plants don't um, have, have not endangered the native diversity, so they have enriched. 
the, the flora of, uh, of the British uh, Isles, but they haven't really, uh, let, this hasn't led to any um, declines in the native flora. But then this paper came out from New Zealand that showed that in fact um, this was associated with a decree decrease in um, regional native richness. So I think there'll be more papers on this and the final word has not been uh, said on this topic. We also know that invasive plants can change ecological functions. Um, Bromus tectorum cheatgrass is very invasive in Western North America, as I mentioned. The problem with this plant is that um, it's a winter annual, so it uh, germinates in, uh, in fall. Um, it, it can grow throughout the, the cool season. And then by spring, when the native vegetation starts to grow, this plant has almost completed its cycle. So it, it becomes dry, and it leads to a lot of dry biomass during a season where um, most of the fires happen. So in, fire, in, in, in some ways, we have this buildup of um, biomass, and this leads to an acceleration of fire events. In the past, these ecosystems experienced probably fires every 100 years. Now it's every 10 years. And last but not least, invasive plants um, burden us with costs. This paper from David Pimentel came out in 2005, and they estimated um, that it's about $120 billion per year the, of costs associated with invasive species surveys and control. Okay, so this is an introduction into biotic exchange. Now I'll talk about my research. So, um, as a student, I, as, as I mentioned, I didn't want to study inv invasive plants. It seemed like everybody was studying invasive plants. Um, I didn't want to do, do anything associated with that. And in fact, I wanted to leave academia. And um, my supervisor back then, uh, Isabel Hensen, my PhD supervisor, I remember at the end of my PhD, I asked her for a reference letter because I wanted to apply for a job with an NGO. And so she came into my office. This is the only time I've seen you very angry. <laughs> She was very impatient with me and, and she told me not to leave academia. <laughs> I'm doing a big mistake. So she, um, she convinced me to stay in science, but I said I'm only going to stay in science if I can work on something applied. Because I felt like I produced papers, but nobody was really interested except maybe my narrow scientific community. So I said I'm going to work on applied ecology. And I met Kara Nelson at a conference. She's a restoration ecologist at the University of Montana and we talked about different topics for a possible postdoctoral project. And we agreed that um, herbicide usage in invasive plant management uh, has received very little attention by scientists. So we, we knew that a lot um, was sprayed or is being sprayed by managers, um, but we couldn't quantify it. And also very few people looked at non-target effects of this practice. So I got a fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation to do postdoctoral work with her. And some of the first things we tackled is we wanted to know how uh, much herbicides are being sprayed to control non-native plants. There's a lot of data on herbicide usage in crop agriculture, in, um, in horticulture even, but this, when we started there was nothing except a sentence in a paper that was not even on quantifying herbicide usage. Um, Rinella and colleagues in Wrote, wrote, up, uh, wrote up the results of their experiment, field experiment, and they mentioned one sentence in their introduction that based on personal communication with um, the land managing agencies in the US, about 120,000 hectares are probably sprayed annually in the United States to control non-native plants in wildlands. So this is all we had. We contacted different offices that we thought would either manage land or um, a supervised herbicide application. It turned out very few tracked, very few offices tracked herbicide usage for this purpose. These um, land managing agencies in the US were the only ones that had data and only four of those shared data with us. So it was the Bureau, Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Forest Service didn't want to share data with us due to uh, data quality concerns. And so what came out was this. So we found out that the 
area sprayed with herbicides just the active ingredient, which is just a small part of the commercial formulation that's being sold, was half a million hectares in 2010. This was the year for which we had the best data coverage. So that's about three or four times higher than previously estimated. And I wrote this number down just, just to give you an idea of how large this is. This is about 462,000 soccer fields, wide lens sprayed with herbicides. Um, in terms of volume used, about 202 thousand <coughs> sorry active ingredients were used which is the same as about 27 uh, those double decker buses <coughs> okay then we uh, looked at what types of herbicides are being used and we thought it would be uh, broadly specific herbicides because a lot of the public land in the US is in the western in the western part of North America and their broadleaf plants are, are especially problematic but what we found was that, in fact, a non-selective herbicide, glyphosate, was the most commonly used. And we got in touch with the land managing agencies who share data with us and, and talked to them about it. And it seems like the, the main reason for this is because glyphosate, uh, the patent for glyphosate ran out. So it's very cheap. It's uh, easily available in Home Depot. You don't need, in many states, you don't need a license. So you need to hire something, somebody with a license. Uh, you can just employ anybody to spray glyphosate. And back then already I started thinking about habitat types. I wanted to know where herbicides, what habitat types are mostly targeted. And it turned out the grasslands were target number one, followed by road maintenance and forests. Okay, so then I continued looking at um, non-target effects. I started a very simple experiment in the greenhouse where I used two herbicides, 14 plant species that are commonly found in grasslands around Missoula. I chose two herbicides, broadly specific herbicides, and applied them at two different rates. So I seeded, I put some seeds into pots and I sprayed them. I just want to, to know what, what happens. Here are the results. I'm not gonna go through every figure and you shouldn't, just gonna narrow it through. So because herbicides are uh, damaged plants, we didn't think that there would be, that we would see any differences between native and non-native plants. And in fact, there were not. So they, they harmed native and non-native plants alike. Uh, but the, the real surprise was that these selective herbicides at the seed stage seemed to lose their selectivity. So grasses and non-grasses were impaired by herbicides alike probably because of their smaller size, or we don't know. There de was definitely a species-specific effect that some species seem to be more vulnerable to herbicides than others. Kara's master student um, continued to work on this. Uh, on this topic, she um, conducted a more elaborate experiment on, in the garden, a common garden experiment, and she applied herbicide, but then uh, waited for about five months to see whether once the herbicides are broken down, maybe the, the germination success will be higher. And in fact, it was to some extent, the main trend was more positive, but still there were some, some native plants that, were, that showed decreased germination. I also collaborated with Ilva, Ilva Lechberg. She's a soil ecologist. She wanted to know the effects on mycorrhizal associations. Um, after following herbicide application. Um, I'm gonna not talk too much about it, but uh, an interesting phenomenon came up that we've only heard from managers anecdotally, and it was that when you spray herbicides, let's say against uh, napweed, you remove the invasive plant, but then this gives an opportunity for other non-native plants to invade the grasses. So one invasive plant replaces the other. Okay, at the end of my um, first postdoc project, studying about future research topics, and if I wasn't working in the greenhouse or sitting in front of my computer, I botanized a lot because um, I love plants. I love to learn more about plants. I love plant ID. So what I did is I, I botanized and um, wanted to get to know the flora a little bit more. And what I um, found striking is that 
it appeared that some habitat types like grasslands or Missoula were highly invaded. So this is leafy spurge, the, the, the plant with the yellow flowers. You can see here this, this used to be probably a native grassland, now totally invaded by leafy spurge. But then there were some habitat types that were not invaded at all. So here is a um, Douglas fir forest, not very far from Missoula, and what you see here in the understory is na all native plants. So why is that? So I, was, I remember I was very excited and I talked to Kara about it and I said, oh, I wonder what happens if you would just take some seeds of some invasive plants because so much available, <laughs> and you just go into a forest and you know, put the seeds out there, you know, what happens? I remember she told me, oh, why would you do that? You know, why would you work in forests? There are no invasive plants. I remember this, this light bulb came, came on and I thought, nobody works on this. A, lo a lot of the invasion ecologists focus on specific invasive plants and habitats that are highly invasive. But I think if we compare, if we can find out why some habitat types are more invasive to others, we could also draw conclusions why these become susceptible to invasive plants uh, to begin with. And I think understanding this is also important because um, it has been argued a lot that preventing non uh, plant invasions is much more cost effective than let's say spraying a site that's totally invaded by a plant. And that increasing habitat resilience is, could be an effective tool to prevent invasions. So this has been stated uh, again and again, but in fact, we have no idea what habitat resilience means. Uh, we, we don't know whether you know, habitats have something intrinsic in them that makes them more susceptible to, to non-native plants or not. And if they do, then this would have important implications because it would mean that we need to maybe put more effort into surveying and monitoring specific habitat types, and also that we need to adjust our land use policy maybe to protect specific habitat types. Okay, a little bit more theory here. So invasion ecologists love hypotheses. And I think the recent review came up with something like 100 different hypotheses <laughs> explaining um, non-native plant invasions. I'm not going to bore you with all of these. I thought I'd just summarize it. Um, um, we, we don't know which of these individual hypotheses is true. What we do know, however, that it has to do with um, how invasive a plant is. So this is what we call invasiveness, the invasibility of a plant community. And it has to do something with propagule pressure because it makes a difference whether you have no propagules of an invasive plant in the site or a lot. <coughs> humans also play a role. So I put humans up here. But how, you know, how they influence plant invasions, we can only guess. So in the, I put together here five leading hypotheses. Um, one of the uh, oldest hypotheses is that if a habitat type or community is very species rich, then it will also have a high resilience. And because probably the more species in a native community can fill out niche space, the less niche space there is available for invasive plants. But um, what our experimental work has shown, or of the community is in fact that, you know, this is very ambiguous. So there are some studies that positive, have po positive results and some negative. The, then there's the fluctuating resource hi hypothesis, which states that if a plant community has ample light, water, and nutrients, this could favor invasive non-native plants, especially when the, if those are highly competitive. Disturbance is also often mentioned as a driver of non-native plant invasions. Disturbance itself is very broad. You can think of different disturbance ways, um, construction, but also landscape fragmentation um, is also a way of disturbance. But these are all hypotheses that relate to, to local processes. It's only very recently we also have been thinking about processes at higher regional at the uh, regional scale. Um, Veronika Kalusova, who was a colleague in, my, uh, in, in the group where I worked before I came here, 
And so in her PhD thesis, she showed that, um, that the donor pool is also very important. So for instance, here in North America, the majority of plants come from Europe and Asia. Sorry to say, <laughs> you've also donated a lot of plants to us. Um, but um, so there is one hypothesis that says this is because in Europe, uh, there are a lot of different habitats associated with human disturbance. So there's a large species pool of plants that are adapted to human disturbance. And they're very successful in North America because here there are comparatively few disturbed habitats. Then there's also uh, a hypothesis I coined introduction bias. I've never read it, but <laughs> I, I, uh, so, well, something that um, was stuck in my mind. I think that also that an introduction bias could lead to um, some habitat types accumulating more non-native plants because we know that the plants that are being introduced, they are not a random selection of a donor pool, but they're biased. We know, for instance, that ornamental plants are disproportionately present. So um, ornamental plants are usually plants that love open habitats, light, uh, ample water, nutrients. So we can suspect that also in these habitat types that feature those conditions, we would have disproportionately more non-native plants. Okay, um, the different approaches that have been used, two different camps. One camp is the experimental biologist camp. They've used uh, pot experiments and common garden experiments to quantify invasibility. And they're great for studying mechanisms, but they've been criticized for artificial conditions. And it, it's very difficult with those to mimic a broad array of habitat types. Now there's also, the other group is the field observational camp, where I'm from. Um, so, so they collect data from a wide range of habitat types, observational data. So you can argue these are more realistic conditions, uh, but they only quantify levels of invasion. They, do an, they don't do any experimental work, so they can't really test the individual mechanisms. So in somehow the, the two camps, they, they never try to combine the two approaches. I did my postdoctoral research in, in one of those camps, <laughs> um, in Milan Hitri's camp. Milan Hitri is a um, vegetation ecologist. And he, um, I got a Marie Curie fellowship to work with him on a new database that was just compiled as I started the European Vegetation Archive. So and this, this archive has combined data from different scientists into a database that includes data for one million plots across Europe. So it's very large. I think it's still the largest vegetation archive in the world. We planned it to be very broad and to look at different habitat types. What happened was that because it was such a large database, we only focused on forests. It was a lot of work. So at once I wrangled the data, I was able to analyze this data set and I specifically looked at forests according to a European forest classification. So what you will see here are different European woodland types. And, and, and on the x-axis, the mean level of invasion which is defined as the percentage of alien plants in a plot compared to the total uh, number of species found in the plot. So what you see here that all of the river woodland habitat types, there were three, were all among the top invaded habitat types. And the one that has a very long bar here are softwood riparian woodlands. For some reason, are highly invaded in Europe. And, and this is the habitat type that if, when you look at like a transaction, transect uh, from, from to the river. This is the habitat type that's um, at, at, uh, very close to the river. It's uh, frequently flooded by rivers. Then coniferous woodlands would show up among the habitat types with the lowest level of invasion. So again, we can't um, test any hypothesis with, with that. But we could say that this might be due to natural disturbance because riparian forests undergo natural disturbance or fluctuating resources. An interesting pattern was that also shrubs and um, trees were disproportionately represented in the species pool as well as in 
and the frequency of non-native plants. And I think that has to do with the fact that in the 19th century, a lot of trees and shrubs were introduced and planted, including, for instance, black locust or Manitoba maple from Canada. <laughs> I'm going to skip this a little bit. Um, then we looked specifically at the origin of species. So half of the species in, that are alien in European forests come from other European regions. And that's, that's shown here, uh, a large European pie here. Then the second group that donated their plants to European forests was North America. And here, trees on large shrubs made up a large proportion, as well as um, temperate Asia. So again, it's, it's biased. Our introductions are biased. So I continue to work, to work on this topic. And I want to say some, some few words for my research is going in the next years. Here are some pictures that I took last summer. I went on this great trip with my field crew from Montana all the way to the Peace River grasslands. And we collected plots. And I just wanted to have an overview of Alberta and the different habitat types there. Um, so this, one of the things I'd like to, um, to do here in Alberta is to look more into differences across habitat types. And Raitha Murillo, uh, a PhD student that joined me in January, is going to work on that. So she is going to look at the habitat types found um, in central Alberta, compare them in, tem in terms of the levels of invasion. And then um, we still need to work on, on her remaining questions, but probably compare what she found in Alberta to other parts of the world that are similar in climate and um, try to um, tease apart different mechanisms underlying habitat invasibility. Uh, Zoe Zapisotsky, uh, MSc student, is looking specifically at grasslands. So she's going to look at the levels of invasion in Alberta grasslands and also aims to analyze the effects of uh, grazing and land ownership. And apart from that, um, just because I'm here and I can introduce myself, I want to say uh, invasion ecology is my main research area, but I also do other research. For instance, I'm very interested in the vegetation of Central Asia. This is a book um, that came out, recent, came out recently, Grasslands of the World, and I contributed a chapter with my co-authors on Central Asia and Kazakhstan. It's an interesting region because it's probably the world's vastest in terms of area, uh, grasslands, that are in public ha hands. And interestingly, there are very few non-native plants or invasive non-native plants. And I don't know why, because I think that um, the Soviet government has invested a lot in introducing new plants, but for some reason, there are almost hardly any invasive plants. Um, I'm also interested generally in open habitat types. And I've started working on bedrock meadows in um, northwestern Montana. This is a habitat type uh, that's found at the mid-elevational zone among forests. So we might think that precipitation is not limiting in this uh, region, um, but there's hardly any information in the literature about them because we, we have studied forests very hard for different reasons, but those open habitat types have been overlooked. Okay, and with that, if I'm good on time, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. more than 15 minutes to grill Victoria. <laughs> so, I, a question about the, the, what defines an archaeophyte. Uh, mm -hmm. You get 8%. How do you tell whether something is an archaeophyte that invaded that long ago as opposed to a native plant? Yeah, um, uh, based on um, archaeological remains, plant remains. Okay, so, yeah. I mean, so that's really a low-ball estimate because it, the further back in time we go, the less likely you are to find that evidence. Am I, or am I wrong about that? The so, more like so they could be. It could be a higher number. It's just you can't find the evidence. For true. It. Yeah, it could be conservative estimate. Yeah, yeah. true. Is, is there any indication as to uh, number of invasive events as a function of time through history? 
that maybe it tapers off at well, I, th I think but it's the signals that they get in their remains. Um, so there's a signal associated with the Neolithic agricultural expansion. There's also an increase in uh, new plants that show up and, and remains uh, associated with the expansion of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Is there any, any indication that doesn't involve human intervention? Um, well, it's only indirectly, but of course, yeah. It's, it's associated with these historic events. Yeah. The mm -hmm. other question was the, the, the conifer forest. I mean, trying to grow stuff under spruce trees is hard because conifers really do things to the soil. That I know. Become, I mean, I'm hospitable. So yeah. I'm wondering if, if, if the total number of species in conifer forest is also lower and it's just a less hospitable place to be invaded because it's a less hospitable place for yeah. many plants. Right, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think there's something about coniferous forests. Um, we don't know what it is. We, we have the descriptions, um, uh, but the thing is we have never conducted experiments or looked further into that because the camp of those you know, descriptive, say, ecologists have never undertaken any experimental work, never compared habitat types. So even if you just hauled a bunch of coniferous forest dirt in and see if <laughs> Yeah, no, it's totally, it's on my to-do list, yep. <laughs> I think the, the problem with experiments, and I've chatted to other colleagues about it, is that, you know, it's not easy because you'd have to introduce non-native plants. You have to find sites and landowners that allow you to, to do that. Um, so, but it's, it's on my radar, yeah, to do that. My question is directly related to that because soil pH is one of the most obvious differences Mm -hmm. um, what's going on between grasslands and coniferous forests. And you can artificially change the pH of soil. So you could do some more like right. mm -hmm. in greenhouse type environment where you, because I can see permitting for putting seeds out of an invasive yes. somewhere like this totally. nightmare. Yeah. So a different way to kind of artificially mm -hmm. try to do that without taking soil out. But you can test different things that way because it's not just soil. You've got mycorrhizae and a whole bunch right. of things going on underground. So if you can like get pH and then some other, you know. Yeah, well, like mesocosm experiments. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. I think so too, <laughs> yeah. Count, I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> so within my lifetime, I noticed a lot of butterflies have changed their range in Alberta by quite substantive ways. Some of them you can trace back to, oh, I don't know, the European skipper has uh, expanded his range because people moved hay around. Mm -hmm. and to a large extent, though, it seems they're just changing their range. Maybe it's changed environmental um, uh, conditions due to human habitat to change. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're evolving. And to what extent are these range changes of these invasives due to uh, like actual adaptation as they go, evolving of the yeah. plants? It could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's absolutely evidence for, um, like you say, um, that these in, uh, introduced plants uh, undergo um, um, selection. Yeah, but it's not my research field. <laughs> yes, I, I know there have been papers uh, on this. Um, yeah, and something we also need to take into account that these are uh, these are processes that are still taking place. You know, just because Northern Alberta has very few invasive plants doesn't mean that it's um, less susceptible, let's say, than southern Alberta. It's, they're moving probably from the south. So we can't just conclude that based on what we see today, you know, that some habitat types are more vulnerable than others. So you refer to some guys as, oh, these are invasive, and then you say, oh, these are really invasive. This is highly invasive. Mm. What does that mean? Well, this guy is moderately invasive. This is a highly invasive plant. Yeah. So no, it's it's my own subjective wording here. Well, um, I shouldn't do it. What is it? Is it is it scale? Is it um, defined it at, or what defines that? Like the well, I shouldn't really differentiate. I I, I want to say I really want, trying to stay objective and use t a right terminology, but I also sometimes fall into this trap of you know saying more invasive, less invasive. Well, <laughs> But yeah, I think um, um, wh what exactly is an invasive plant or species is debated. There are different definitions. Um, some involve just uh, whether a plant is 
uh, able to colonize natural habitat or not, whether a plant is um, you know, very frequent at the regional scale or very uh, dominant at the local scale. And that one slide you gave us there suggested that that was defined invasiveness based on scale of habitat. The conce that, that conceptual that figure? Is it also related to reproductive rates or anything like that? Or? No, I think, I think you refer to the Richardson at all. Slide, this one? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's all, the, here they define only as uh, being able to colonize natural habitat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But some have argued that we need to, to also take into account economic costs. And do any guys, would you say, oh, it, it, this has been highly invasive for these few years, and it looks like whatever, however we're going to find um, this drops off? Yes. Mm. There have been cases like this. Um, can't think of any examples right now, um, including North America. Yeah, I would have to look into literature. But yeah, cases have been reported of um, invasive plants. Do well for a while, and yeah, I think um, um, Canada thistle, it's an introduced plant in, in, in Western North America, I think was reported to be very invasive uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, and then it's not was reported as not to be very invasive afterwards. Now it's more knapweed and leafy spurge. Mm -hmm. there, there are examples that could go the other way around. Where in New Zealand, I know they have um, a testing facility where they, they look to see how invasive plants are, and they have to they have to raise them for at least five years or so to to, mm -hmm. to see because once they get established, then they can become really invasive. Yeah. Uh, but initially, they may not be. Right. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Are, are there any invasive plants in Alberta that you think we should like sp start spending money on right now to control? Um, like, is there a plant or plants on your hit list? Well, I think um, so. One of the first things I did here when I came, I I pulled data from the um, Vasco Plant Database in Canada just to see how many plants are in Alberta. Turns out there are 350 plants, which 16% of the species pool. Um, and what I would like to do is before like looking at individual plants like to find out which ones are invasive or not has never been defined for Alberta. We have the noxious plants that are listed by the government, but those does, don't have to be, you know, what we as biologists define as invasive. Um, so, yeah, so my approach, again, coming to your question, back to your question, um, probably Kentucky bluegrass and smooth broom are currently um, invading, you know, at the stage of expansion but we know very little about them because they have not been listed as noxious weeds in the past. But overall, my approach is just to look at, at the entire species pool, not, not, you know, there's been some, some people had, who have dedicated their whole career studying just specific invasive plants. I, I like to look at the entire species pool, different habitats. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think you said uh, fluctuating resources was one of the hypotheses, mm -hmm. but I didn't get the fluctuating part. It just looked like it was highly productive areas. Where's the fluctuating? Yeah, some habitat types like uh, riparian forests are a good example because they receive those floods, um, you know, periodically and floods bring nutrients. Floods bring also, you know, might um, lead to um, uh, um, tree gaps, natural tree gaps. So there's lots, lots of light. So fluctuating. Also natural disturbance. See, by rodents. Um, we know that disturbance leads to a release of um, nitrogen, for instance. I'll ask a question. So when my husband came here, he was all concerned, coming from Australia, about native versus non-native plants. Then he realized that until you know, 14,000 years ago, Alberta was under ice. So <laughs> nothing is native. Everything has invaded in some way mm -hmm. or another. If you're going to be looking at invasive Alberta plants, how are you going to draw the line between, you know, everything is non-native, right? Well, everything on the, on, the, on the entire is planet. Time, you can... Is there a time zone uh, or timeline where you're going to say pre-European is native, even if yes, I would. Aboriginal people brought those plants from Europe with them? Or are you going to say uh, that only plants that clearly did not via humans or native, what's, how are you going to define those? Plants? I think I'll define it broadly that those plants that um, are known um, 
in, in the province since European colonization. There might be archaeophytes present, I don't know. I'm not sure there are any papers on that, um, archaeophytes in North America. I, I have no idea. Eastern Canada where there was a lot of trade in Maybe. plants. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. That's how so I define it. Use European oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. contact as the mm -hmm. So if you take a gradient of some resources or pH conditions in the soil, getting back to this conifer game, mm -hmm. and, that, and we're to place all the species distributions in terms of what they can, in fact, tolerate mm -hmm. in that total range, wouldn't you come up with a situation where these highly acidic soils just never have high numbers of species? So that the, basically these trees have won the game, in a sense, that they created a situation to get rid of all these pesky competitors. Maybe. I actually think that it's not so much the soil pH. I think it's, um, it's linked to nutrient cycling and nutrient sequestration or nitrogen sequestration. Um, because, again, the introduced species pool is not um, random, it's highly biased towards competitive species. So um, I think those invasive plants don't thrive in coniferous forests because they're, um, uh, the nutrient cycling um, is very conservative, so there's very little leaching. So there have been studies that show in, in habitat types that are, have a very high humus content in soil or uh, cryptogam cover, all these excessive nutrients abound. They're not released into the ecosystem, so there are not many nutrients available for competitive invasive plants. So that's a productivity game, then, in, sen in a sense, is, is that you take productivity in a broader sense as what are the actual available nutrients. Mm -hmm. It's a low productivity yep. habitat, and that's why... That's where a direction where I would like to move to, yeah, the, the role of nutrient cycling across habitat types, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no further questions, let's all thank Victoria. Mm -hmm. for thank you for coming.